Greetings, building science enthusiasts, and welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Panasonic, and I'm excited to tell you about their IntelliBalance TM100, the customizable, high-performance, high-efficiency ERV for any climate zone. We've got this Panasonic ERV in our office, and I can confidently say that it really does make a world of difference. It's got dual ECM monitors with SmartFlow TM Optimum CFM technology and PicaFlow speed selector capability. Basically, the IntelliBalance 100 lets you truly customize airflow, balanced positive or negative pressure, and at speeds from 50 to 100 CFM. You'll love their exclusive built-in ASHRAE 62.2 timing function that helps ensure code compliance. And if you're worried about energy use, I've got good news. The IntelliBalance 100 won the industry's prestigious Best of IBS Award for Best Energy Efficient Product at this year's NAHB International Builders Show. The IntelliBalance 100 is also Energy Star certified for the Canadian market and can be connected to existing ductwork or used as a standalone whole house ventilation solution. Seriously, this thing is the real deal. Improve your indoor air quality, maintain energy efficiency, and give yourself some breathing room with the cost-effective IAQ solution for any climate zone. Welcome to this. Okay. Oh, welcome to the Building Science. To the Building Science Podcast. 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 Welcome to the Building Science Podcast. Bringing the human factor to architecture and design. Brought to you by Positive Energy in Austin, Texas. Okay, hello everybody. Hello and welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. I'm Christoph Irwin. Here with my trusty sidekick, Miguel. Hey, everyone. As always, today, to kick off the new year, 2018, I have the great good fortune to introduce you all to James Gepner of Big Yellow Cab. And we're going to be talking today about market transformation and behavior change, and specifically in the context of world-class buildings. And James has a fantastic background in this. He's advised and developed initiatives for nonprofits, new ventures, and mature companies in infrastructure, technology, media, education, health, and housing. Today, we're going to be leveraging his housing expertise. You know what? I feel like I'm reading this. (laughs) Does it sound like I'm reading this? No, it sounded very off the cuff. Really? I don't know anymore. So restarting. He founded Big Yellow Cab in order to apply social science research, which is awesome, to uh, and the procedures of behavior change to important social and environmental issues. And as you listeners of the podcast know, we have often lamented why is the public, why is society not asking us for better buildings? And James, maybe we could just start right there. Um, first of all, maybe you want to uh, add something to the introduction, perhaps? No, that introduction that introduction was great. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, the only thing I maybe would add is that um, uh, after having studied the building market, um, I started a race 40 as, ah, yes. as a vehicle to address some of these um, barriers to widespread adoption of passive buildings. Let's, let's actually start with that. Please tell us about Erase 40. So Erase 40 is an organization whose sole purpose is to address the barriers to widespread adoption and market transformation to passive buildings or to zero energy buildings. Basically, at Big Yellow Cab, we did a, a fairly large study of the industry Uh, and found a number of barriers to adoption and also found a number of reasons why those barriers weren't being addressed. Uh, I can sort of get into that now. Yeah, exactly. That was my first question is, is why is market transformation occurring at this seeming snail's pace it is? And what are the barriers to adoption of better buildings? So I, I guess the place to begin is that any market might have a problem or might have some barrier to it functioning in a certain way. In the case of the building industry, that problem isn't being addressed. In other industries, there might be players with enough consolidated power that it would justify them making investments to addressing those problems. But the building industry is so fragmented, uh, individual building firms and architectural firms are very small. So an individual firm can't uh, afford, for example, to run a national ad campaign, or they can't afford to you know, have a person study the entire market and look at where the behavioral barriers are. So there's all sorts of things that if, if, if the building industry was, say, like one large monopoly, there would be uh, 
a staff of people with a different very you know various expertise to address those problems. But in the case of the uh, building industry, firms are so small they can't they can't afford to sort of tackle those things. They can't afford to make those investments. What would be barriers that would be identified, and then money would be put against to, to addressing those barriers? In this case, they aren't being addressed. So a race forty is basically a funding vehicle that uh, I started in order to allow builders and architecture firms to collectively fund things that are necessary to make the passive building industry um, or the passive building market to function. So one example is a national ad campaign. Individually, one firm can't afford a national ad, ad campaign, but collectively, builders and architects could easily afford a national ad campaign. So that's that's the purpose of a race for it. We're trying to basically collect like-minded people to start the market transformation by doing studies and by doing ads to help um, educate and advocate for better practices. I have a question that came up when you were speaking there, though. Does the market itself want to change, right? Is it, it it's set up in a certain way? It has its financial interests maybe um, working right now. The market is, there's a lot of stakeholders and the market, it, it's, it's fragmented, but it's a known entity. What do you think? Does the market itself want to change? So Does, it's a it's a really great question. And what I would say to that is that it rests, what you just said, kind of rests on an assumption that is kind of accepted as a truth. And that is that markets are mysterious things that, you know, are, are some sort of divine creation as opposed to produced by our actions. A market is not a mysterious entity beyond our control. It is really a collection of needs and desires and how those needs and desires are addressed. So if, if we act on the assumption that a market is beyond our control, we're really just um, sitting on the sidelines and, and um, doing nothing. Yeah, doing we're like sheep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give us the buildings you're going to give us without us telling you what buildings we want. Yeah. And so um, the question to ask is, do passive buildings satisfy a need? So do they satisfy a need better than the alternatives? Um, and if the answer is yes, then the market for passive buildings should be very robust. Mm -hmm. So if the market for passive buildings is not robust, then the question we need to ask is, what is standing in the way of that market being robust? And I think that's where we are with passive building. Can you elaborate on that? What is standing in the way? In, in my view, um, the conditions exist right now for a market transformation to passive buildings. And when I say that, what I'm saying is tomorrow, absent any policy change, there could be a robust market for passive buildings. When a person um, walks into an architect's office, for instance, and says, what is the price per square foot of the building? And the architects just presented them with um, a passive house proposal. The way that they answer that question could really inadvertently push that prospect toward the choice of a conventional home. If, the, if the, a person says, what is the payback period for the additional cost of, of um, a passive house? That right. almost no matter how you answer that question, there's one, there's one way out of that trap, but that will push people towards the, you know, it doesn't mean they will purchase, but it will push them towards the purchase of a conventional house. Ooh, what is that one way out? The one way out is to say that a payback period is a distorted view of the situation. If I buy a stock, say, then I have two questions about that stock. What is the price, the, what is the price per share of purchasing that versus the expected sale price. That's one. And the second thing is, what is the carrying cost of having that stock? So if I'm purchasing a stock at $20 per share and I expect it to sell at $30 per share, great, that checks. I, I, I can purchase according to that metric. Now I just look at my carrying cost. Is the monthly or annual carrying cost high or low? So when a person says, when will the period when is the payback period? The presumption there, or the implication, is that the purchase price, the premium, will not be reflected in the resale. So if a if a passive house costs, oh, interesting. yeah, if a passive house costs five percent more, 
then it's going to, you know, it's going to it cost that much more for a reason because it's delivering benefits that a conventional house that they get to enjoy. Exactly. Yeah. So that the 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 second buyer is going to also value those benefits. So that is an investment, that premium, that is going to be paid back to the buyer. That is so important. So saying mm-hmm. what is the payoff period implies that- You're using up the benefits somehow. Yeah, that you're using up the benefits, that it's not in perpetuity. So there isn't a payback period. The, the fact that there's a payback period is a misnomer. It's, it's, like a, it's a poor understanding of how of how financial transactions work. Right. And and that core under that, that misunderstanding or that lack of understanding it's um, somewhat implicit in the in the marketplace and I want to give you a, a real world example. I have the great good fortune to to have um, both a professional and an informal friendship with many many architects and builders here in Austin and they'll speak candidly to me. They're like saying things like this. Man, I love what you guys are doing. Great enclosures, you know, um, mechanical system design for health and comfort. I love it, but I just can't sell it. The fact of the matter is my clients just don't care about that stuff. It's invisible to them. And what they really care about is the tile in the bathroom. Right. Right. And so can you help me revise their, how, what would I say to that? Well, no, I'll add before, before we jump in, it seems like on the consumer facing side, there is this sort of perception issue, right? We need to completely reorient the way that people are thinking about those financial transactions. But in order for that to happen, it's sort of a chicken or the egg argument with me because on the on the contractual side, because construction is very fragmented, there are very mismatched um, risk and reward allocations and contracts. And so it's sort of like the, the only feedback that a lot of consumers are getting is a contractor or an architect saying like, well, I know what works. I know what's worked historically. And so this is what we can do. And so how, how does a consumer become informed enough to sort of overcome that barrier as well? That, that seems like a really interesting piece of not even nuance, just, just a barrier that, that needs to be overcome here. Yeah. So, so you're saying in my question, the builder is also not knowing the situation properly. Is right. what you're saying. There. Exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. So the builder says to me, they just like the tile more than the you know, health and comfort. Sorry. Right. How do you address that? So it's a great question. There are a finite number of variables that determine why we engage in any behavior um, or how we come to make a decision. And mm-hmm. the, the, the sort of bulk of the work that we're doing at Race 40 um, and Big Yellow Cab is to go, okay, so what's behind that choice or what's behind that decision? So in the case of the building industry um, or in case of that person who says, um, um, my client's only interested in the tile, then what's important for the builder to understand or for the architect to understand when a person makes a decision, um, they're following a map. So that map is going to lead them to a certain destination. So now imagine if I'm, imagine if I have a group of friends um, and we go out to dinner once a month and I, I claim in the group that I am the, I'm the best at picking the best restaurant. And so they go, okay, go ahead, James, go ahead and pick the restaurant. And month after month, I pick a restaurant that is, has, has bad service and maybe the restaurant has health code violations. Now, I think that I'm following this process to come up with the best restaurant, but I keep leading us to the wrong destination. When you think about following a map to make a decision, if you're following a map and that map consistently leads you to the wrong destination, then it's not a very good map. If we think about people's behavior or about, think about what informs their decision, some of these things are conscious, some of these are unconscious, but they're, they're following a path. And, and on that path are a number of things that can, is gonna push them one way or another. When a person says, only the tile is important to me, or only my, clients, my client only cares about the tile, then basically you have to understand that, that something has caused them to be focusing on that but they're not realizing what their destination is in a way because, mm-hmm. because with the purchase of a house comes outcomes. In the, case, in the example I just gave you, the outcome is my friends and I end up at a restaurant with health code violations, right? So my friends would be right to say, you know, I don't know what's informing your decision, but, um, but whatever is informing that process is not very good information. So if a person focusing on a tile is... Um, is having certain things 
pushing them in the direction of focusing that. Basically, their assumption is, one of the assumptions they're making is that houses are basically all the same except for aesthetics. So yeah. that there is no variation in outcomes from one house to another. And so the only thing I need to focus on is how things look and is, are the aesthetics in that house pleasing to me? But as we know, um, the choice of a house can lead to very different financial outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. there, are, that there are like 10 million people or more that are on energy assistance in this country. Mm. We know that there are about 24 million people in this country with asthma and indoor air quality is a serious problem that can contribute to those symptoms. Um, yeah. We know that from recent studies that um, CO2 buildup in a building can actually decrease in a very short period of time cognitive function. Um, mm -hmm. We know that exterior noise um, can disrupt, disrupt a person's sleep. Um, and I don't know if you guys can hear the uh, leaf blower outside. It seems like every time we record a podcast, someone has some kind of small gas engine running. So it's very real. <laughs> it is, exactly. It is very real. So, so all those are outcomes. And if the builders and architects know that there is basically a map that helps a person make a certain decision, then they're going to be aware of, of how one thing or another is pushing a person towards the right direction, which is towards the best outcomes for that person, or um, towards inferior outcomes. So what decisions mm -hmm. my group of friends is going to help me get to a good restaurant with good service and good food and no health code violations versus what's pushing me towards the bad restaurant with health code violations. The way the convention, the way that basically um, that most home decisions work, what's informing those decisions consistently and systematically pushes people towards homes that are of inferior quality. It's important that we think about what's shaping that decision, what's informing that person, and why they're, map, why they're, why they're ending up in a place that delivers them poor outcomes, you know, delivers them poor indoor air quality that has health um, implications. Um, it delivers them um, significant energy and repair costs. When they, if they factor those things into the decision-making process, then they're going to you know, make choices that deliver about better outcomes for them. Right, right. And this is one of the, the so our listeners are, there's a lot of architects and a lot of builders. We know that there, there are other, there are consultants and engineers, but one of the things that I really appreciate about what you're saying is you are helping, you know, bridge this gap between behavior change, you know, this decision-making behavior on one hand, which is at a lower level and then market transformation, which is at a higher. And what I hear you saying is that architects and builders are these frontline advocates that have the time with the clients to help them change the structure of their map or revise. They see it like in, like all it is is an aesthetic thing. Clients are making decisions all day long. Architects and builders are sitting across the table advising them on those decisions. But outcomes aren't well understood. The architects and builders have a really um, large and unique opportunity to help direct people's decision-making process. And, and the two hours that, you know, as an example that uh, a builder or architect spends with a prospect is yeah. a really large amount of time to be able to help them make that decision. So in, mm -hmm. in one example, right now we're, um, Erase40 is developing a program that will change the way people value energy savings. Energy and repair savings of a passive house could add up to about $120,000. Now we have a bias. Well, over what time period? Over about a 30 year time period. Um, wow. So if you assume, you know, uh, between 75 and $90,000 for energy savings and then furnace replacement, roof repair, um, different small purchases that go into um, improving a house, then, then, you know, these savings add up for the, for the home. Oh market. yeah. But when we when a when a prospect walks into the room, what they're faced with is a multivariable decision. It's a complex decision. It's a decision that they don't have a lot of practice in making. Um, it's a decision that they um, you know involves um, a lot of complexity. And so when they are presented with this idea of energy and repair savings, they frequently discount it. So. One, one tendency we all have is to, 
discount um, long-term rewards in favor of short-term rewards. Mm-hmm. So if a if a <laughs> if a if a architect presents a home buyer with this choice, they say option A is a passive house that's three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Option B is a conventional house that's three hundred thousand dollars a year, but that its costs, cumulative costs, are going to be one hundred and twenty thousand dollars more than the passive house. Right. You'd think that the people would just go, okay, well, the passive house is less expensive. But that, in fact, that's not what occurs. What occurs right. is that people go, oh, that $25,000, that seems like a lot. And the reason they say it th- seems like a lot, it does seem like a lot, is because the home buyer is discounting those energy and repair savings. They're seeing these costs on a horizon, and they're basically not counting them at all in their calculation. So they, so the passive house seems expensive, relatively speaking, and, and they want to choose the conventional house. It is directly against their own self-interest, but that is just, you know, one bias that we all have. We all, we all have a hard time eating our vegetables and sticking with exercise regimens because, because we want, instead we want the brownie or the donut or to sit down and read a magazine. You know, we, we choose the things that have the most immediate rewards. And with the option between a passive house and a conventional house, the, the way that expresses itself is that people focus on price instead of cumulative costs. Hidden there is all the health benefits and the thermal comfort. Exactly, but if, if, if in, in this example, we just put those aside, for the time being, right. just focus it's on... It's hard to quantify those. Well, it's, it's hard to quantify, but, but if we just think about the financial implications, um, right. that people take tend to focus on the price and that causes them to look at... Um, to, well, it causes them to favor the conventional house. So, so what can the architect or builder do? Well, Race40 is now developing a program and getting ready to, to fund it that has people... Um, change this particular behavior. So they're not looking at price, but they're looking at cumulative costs. You know, right, they can already do this, right? The, there's already materials out there that'll help them look at cumulative costs. It's the behavior that's important. The information's already available. It's getting them right. to change the behavior. So, um, so the architect and builder has an opportunity and that's what this program will do. So this is an opportunity for builders and architects to um, change the way that prospect values their services. If, um, if the home buyer or the prospect sees the full value of those energy savings, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to in turn see the value of that passive builder or that passive architect services. Those services deliver this outcome. That is not, that is not an outcome that a conventional builder or architect can deliver. So right away, there is a premium associated with the services Mm -hmm. of that passive architect or builder. So that's hugely important. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a market differentiator for them and their brand. Exactly, it's a differentiator. Um, and it, again, it also helps that prospect or that home buyer make a decision which leads them to the best outcome, which is mm-hmm. saving that money. I, so I have a distinction I wanna make here. So the, a lot of times architects tell me that their client has come in and said that the client attitude is basically, um, I'm really interested in saving the environment or I'm really interested in um, low energy use or energy efficiency, but then their behavior doesn't necessarily match that. Do you know, I mean, are attitudes and behavior typically uncorrelated or? Typically attitudes have uh, uh, a very little connection to a specific behavior. So, Mm. So there's a Canadian study that um, interviewed 500 people and they asked them about their personal personal views about picking up litter. 94% okay. of the people in that study said that people bore a personal responsibility for picking up litter when they saw it. So not even their own litter, but litter around them. Wow. So they had the people in this study, they had people. 94%, 94% said if I see litter on the street, even if I didn't put it there, I should, I should pick, pick it up. up. And so the people filled out that study and then they walked outside and the people who um, conducted that study strategically planted litter outside. <laughs> and then they watched to see um, what the participants in the study would do. 
only 2% of the people picked up litter. Oh my goodness. So 94% said that, so 94% said that their attitude is they should do it, but then 2% actually express that Correct. behavior. So, so when we think about a person saying I'm an environmentalist or I'm concerned about climate change in the context of a prospect meeting or the context of, you know, making a, a choice to purchase a passive house over a conventional one, um, that doesn't, it doesn't mean the person is going to choose a conventional house, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to. It's, it's information that I wouldn't take very seriously because attitudes don't correlate with behavior. And there are things, basically what's important um, for that person's choice is how they measure value. And we can right. actually study and quantify how people measure value. So there are things that we know right away when people are purchasing a house, they measure value. They measure, they look at the safety of the neighborhood, they look at the quality of the school system, they look at the size of the house, the number of bathrooms, the aesthetics, right? Those are all things that are, that are, I want to say, universal across these purchase decisions. But there are other things as well. And the thing is, how will we measure them? So when people, you know, how do people measure the importance of indoor air quality? How do people measure the importance of energy and repair savings? Um, mm -hmm. How do people, like how important on a scale of one to 10 are these various attributes? From a scale, on a scale from one to 10, how important it is is it for a house to dampen exterior noise so that noise won't interrupt a person's sleep? So um, those, those things, we can all quantify those, but we can also subject those things to change. We can also, we can help those people see that there are value in each of those attributes of a house so that they can make the best decision. If going back to your early example, the person's focusing on a tile, we can say, we can show the person that what kind of role exterior noise, air quality play in their life to help basically map that decision to the best possible outcome for that person. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so yes, it's, it's builders and architects should definitely understand that, that attitudes, that attitudes don't correlate to behaviors and that, that behavior is extremely important um, in their decision of what kind of house to buy. It seems like what I'm hearing you say is that attitudes don't impact behavior, but there is an underlying map or an underlying belief that does motivate behavior. And in the tile example, it might be as simple as the belief is um, simply that, well, I can either have the aesthetic, the, the tile or the aesthetic finish I want, or I can have the comfort that I want. And it's not an either or choice. It's right? a very good point. So yeah. The, the aesthetics, if a person wants uh, a certain kind of aesthetic in a house, they can get that kind of aesthetic in a conventional house or in a passive house that, should, that right. shouldn't dictate their choice. Um, what they can't get is necessarily is high indoor air quality in a conventional house, whereas they can get it in a passive house. Right. 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 And the, the belief also, as you clearly pointed out, I appreciated it, that largely across the industry, the implicit belief that a lot of um, not just owners sitting on one side of the table, but builders and architects on the other, there's this implicit belief that says things are basically fine with the enclosure and the mechanical systems. And really the big decisions are on the aesthetics. Yeah, that's, that is, it's an interesting thing because, um, you know, the, this industry has a certain history and in the past architects were probably selling design but now that's not the case. Now they're selling design and technology. Yeah. Technology comes with certain implications. So how they differentiate that technology is extremely important to the person's, to the home buyer's choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there is some nuance. You know, the, the codes are obviously pushing things in this direction. And so some of it is going to come without choice, I think, for, for architects, for builders. They're going to have to start wrestling with sort of new ways of thinking about how we're actually working with a home as a system of systems. One of the things that I think is impacting architects and builders is the inherent speed and busyness of our culture right now. All of us are challenged to find time to do all the things we want to do. Goodness, we have so much new opportunity for en entertainment and distraction at our hands. We believe we don't have time or energy to actually learn the functional side of a building, right? And it's intimidating. So then there's this pushback. Uh, one more just concrete example on that. 
the pushback. Uh, we have some friends that are on the local HBA and they came to a, a happy hour event here at our office and said, oh yeah, we were discussing implementation of the new energy code. And I said, oh, what do you mean by that? And, you know, I kind of joked. And I said, do you mean like how you're going to resist implementation of the new energy code? And they kind of looked down and said, well, yeah. <laughs> um, so here it is. The society is through code is saying, look, we want to shift in this direction. And the builders who could be frontline advocates for this change are like, you know, I don't want to have to deal with the hassle of, you know, retraining myself and retraining my subs. It's a lot of inertia to overcome, I think. Yeah. So their belief there impacts their behavior, which impacts their client's um, behavior. Yeah, that's true. I, you know, I would, I would, I want to push back a little bit on that. Uh, nothing oh, that you please. said was wrong there, but but I want to push back a little bit because you know, architects and builders, passive architects and builders, are in a difficult. Position. Yeah, I'm not trying to vilify. Yeah, no, no, I don't. I don't think you are. I don't think you are <laughs> um, at all. Um, but so here are. Let me take a couple steps back. Um, ages ago, one thing that I noticed working on different projects is that the expertise that was given to um, large companies was enormous and that small companies um, just really mm. weren't given this help. Um, and it, it wasn't, it was just never in their universe. So not only right. weren't, they, weren't they given certain help, they weren't even kind of aware that there were um, certain ideas, certain methods, procedures, theories that were being employed to great advantage by massive companies. Wow. And, and they just didn't have it to their advantage. Now, this is to me, it was kind of a depressing fact because what I saw was that a lot of the innovation comes out of small companies. So the people with some of the most important things for us all have the, the greatest disadvantages. Fascinating. And this is where Race 40 comes in. This actually, is where, right there. This is, exactly. This is where Race 40 comes in and, and Big Yellow Cab as well. It's like, basically mm -hmm. my question was, can we give, make this existing knowledge available to small companies? So there's, you know, jobs to be done theory, which is a, which is a product innovation theory that is um, advocated by some professors in Harvard. Um, an example of what um, job to be done theory can do is it views certain products through what they call use costs. Okay. So an example is software updates. The old way was to get a floppy disk in the mail, right? And that mm -hmm. took time to update it. And, and that time was the use cost. So now software updates happen automatically with the push of a button or with the push of a button. So reducing those use costs is one way to improve a product and to maybe even have that product take over the market. An example in the case of homes of a use cost would be cleaning gutters. Now, if you get rid of gutters, you've just eliminated a use cost and you have an important differentiator because that time necessary to clean the gutters is gone. So that's one. That's just an example of one theory um, and how that theory can be applied to helping a small business or helping a small business with this product. There's competitive theory, which says um, in certain situations, the costs of price competition for a business or for a market. And in this case, I think price competition is the wrong strategy to get uh, mass adoption of, of passive buildings. Small businesses don't necessarily get this help. And moreover, um, the architects and builders find themselves in this dual position. Not only do they not get, get this assistance or have access to this kind of existing knowledge base that larger companies do, but they also play this dual role of designer or builder, basically the product person, and mm -hmm. CEO. Large companies don't have to do that. They have people who can specialize and dedicate every hour of the day to their one task. So, I mean, let's look at a heart surgeon. A heart surgeon, let's just say it's probably wrong, but let's just say a heart surgery takes four hours. The person, you know, the heart surgeon looks at their calendar and they break up every day into two slots and they do two surgeries a day. That surgeon just has to go and do as many surgeries as possible. So they, they stick to their, you know, 10 surgeries a week and they know as long as they stay at 10, they're delivering as much value as they can. Now, let's just say someone came along and said, you know, I would like you to run a company for heart surgeons. <laughs> I want like, you know, to create a company that has a hundred heart surgeons there. And they go to this, let's say they go to one of the top heart surgeons and say, we'd like you to run this company because you know, you're a great heart surgeon. So what would that heart surgeon do? 
The heart surgeon right. would say no, <laughs> because the work I do as a heart surgeon is more, I deliver more value in that capacity than I would in doing the administrative work of running a company of heart surgeons. I and so it. architects and builders, passive architects and builders, you know, have to ask these questions about, um, you know, the decision, the decision trees of their, of their clients and how to market and how to get fund and funding streams and all these different things they have to consider. And they don't really have the time to do it. You know, if these right. architects and builders had experience as being a CMO and had an MBA so they understood finance and they could analyze markets, even if they had spent all that time doing those things, they still wouldn't have time to do both of them at work. You know, they have to choose right. one or the other. Do they want to design great buildings and build great buildings? Or do they want to understand the sort of administrative machinery of their company and how markets and the work? Psychological and the machinery. psychology and, <laughs> you know, competitive theory and all these things. It's like they can't do it. They just really can't mm -hmm. do it. So this is in another reason why I thought a race 40 was so important because here is if market transformation is going to happen, then there needs to be a national advertising campaign. There needs to be someone to analyze the barriers. There needs to be someone who looks at the different populations and look at what's informing those decisions and try to map those decisions to the best outcomes. So there needs to be the work, but I, it, it can't really fall on the shoulders of the architects and builders just because they simply right. don't have enough time. That heart surgeon wouldn't be filling out RFP responses. They wouldn't be running their own marketing campaigns. They, you know, they would they would spend certain times in the meetings with the person who's going to get the surgery. In the architect's case, the prospect, but they wouldn't necessarily do everything with the prospect. They'd have other people fill out forms, collect information, and so forth. So the point we need to get to just acknowledge that passive architects and passive builders have a tremendous value in converting this market. It can't, it can't be done without them. So if they have that value, then they really need to be freed from doing certain tasks. The yeah. tasks need to be done. They can't be neglected, but it needs to be someone else helping them. Right, right. This is so great. I want to take it personal. Positive energy. We primarily deliver high performance mechanical designs. That's what we get paid to do. We are also very, very active in sitting across the table from people, educating and advocating. I mean, the podcast here, this is part of that work. And it would be so nice if, well, let me say it a different way. The reality is what happens is often at the end of using our services, an architect or a builder or an owner will say, that was really great. I did not know a service like yours existed, which is a huge barrier to the uptake of our services um, and a huge overhead burden for us to try to overcome that. And there's another layer to it that I wonder, I'm very curious how you're going to relate to this, James. So here we are, Positive Energy is saying, for instance, in our market, you know, I really don't like ductboard and flex duct for as your air distribution system. And I can stand by that for, from you know, fluid dynamics and indoor air quality and energy use principles. I can totally back that up with facts. But there, there's another reality that in the market, when I say that, people don't want to hear it. They, they like, they almost... I have received something that I perce perceived as like aggression or anger, like quit it, quit saying that eating a burger is unhealthy. You know, quit saying that what I'm doing is wrong. Like you're disrupting my market. It was fine without you and all these, you know, crazy out of the, out of the blue ideas that you're bringing in. Right. Um, where is that coming from? Can you help me understand what well, that sense of um, it's like, I'm, it's like I'm, frightening them or something. Sure. I mean, well, I think, I think you hit it on the head. Um, you are frightening them through uh, what is now 50 or 60 years of social science research and, you know, millions, millions and millions of dollars from the National Institute of Health and from the CDC. There has been all this um, investment in behavioral sciences. And out of this investment um, has come a number of behavioral models. And these these models predict behavior. What they do is they break a behavior into a certain number of variables. And, you know, you see if basically um, there's kind of a yes, no on each of the variables, whether that behavior will occur. When you describe what you just described to me, I see it according to those variables. So the first variable is, 
does the person see a benefit to the behavior of adopting the behavior that you're suggesting? Um, they're not refuting that, so they probably do. Or is it a threat? So, so mm-hmm. they probably do see the benefit. The second is, what are the norms? What are the people important to them doing? You mean their clients by that? What are the norms? Well, what do you mean by that? So if I'm in a community of um, roofers, then, oh. then I'm going to think, you know, I'm probably going to have some opinions about which roofers are lousy roofers and which roofers are great roofers. I'm probably going to have mm-hmm. I'm probably going to have some friends in that community, and if if those people that I think are great roofers and my friends, I'm probably going to take what they do as being very important. And I might adopt a lot of those behaviors myself. So there's a very strong link between what is what those sort of people important to me are doing and what I'm going to do. The first variable is, do they see benefits? The second variable, what are others doing? A Mm -hmm. third variable is what sort of control do they do they have or do they perceive that they have? So Uh if the person thinks, if they have some suspicions, and these suspicions can be unconscious, that I don't have um, necessarily the ability to get this skill, or I don't know how to sell that particular kind of building, or mm-hmm. I feel like my own skills are being outdated or becoming outmoded because of this technology, then, um, then I'm not going to think I'm capable of this behavior, and I'm going to see it as a threat to me, and I might become and hostile to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. I like it. So, um, w- the roofer idea, you, you're touching in on the, the peer influence, right? The, the, in the peer community of roofers, there'll be a very quote unquote, very successful roofer and maybe a one less successful. And interestingly, the very successful roofer will probably influence that community, but the success is maybe not measured on it. Maybe it's measured on financial terms, not on how durable the roofs are and, and whether they leak or not. It's just that's that, that's the, a good point because mm-hmm. that that measure, like uh, let's just say that that roofer is um, really successful, and that roofer in conversations keeps saying to his friends, um, "I made, I made, um, or my firm made two million dollars last year." And mm-hmm. that is the metric by which they're judging their own performance. But if that roofer yeah. said, um, I have a rate of 99% no leak buildings, then their friends are going to see that as a cue to say, oh, I'm, let's measure our performance according to how few leaks we can deliver. Um, so right. that, um, without them necessarily explicitly saying, if they're judging their own performance by one standard or another, that can be highly influential. Yeah. And we're doing it as a society. We're, we're, we're valuing financial gain and, and we see um, someone with a lot of money as sort of powerful. But, you know, what if that roofer went on like, you know, I made $2 million last year. What I did was I exploited my labor. I didn't give them any benefits in terms of health care or anything like that. They were all subcontractors and I sold inferior product as though it was superior product. But look at me, I made a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I think what the example tells us, um, I mean, I agree with everything you just said, but I think what the example tells us is how, um, how easy it is and how small, of, how profound of an effect a small change can have. So the yeah. roofer is saying mm-hmm. to his friends, look at how few leaks I've delivered to my customers. That ripples That's out. That's a very small change. It's a very easy change. It's, very, it's something that is within our reach. It doesn't cost us anything but that can have very profound effects. And so just taking that example a little further, um, there are you know, probably hundreds or thousands of opportunities like that for passive architects and passive builders to um, influence those around them. So the, the things that frequently what a Big Yellow Cabin a Race 40 looks at are things that are um, extremely easy to do, but may have been overlooked. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, the, the incentives may be, um, push people towards the wrong decision right now, but that doesn't mean that it wouldn't be really easy to adopt, um, a different, um, a different, you know, a a different approach that might be more effective. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Okay. One more specific question tied into this. Fantastic. This is really where I wanted this conversation to go. So I have a, another lunch a couple of weeks ago and a builder, really good guy, a good connection says to me, so, so background is we install, we recommend the installation of uh, VRF multi-splits because they have 
really good part load efficiency, and we recommend dedicated dehumidifiers. So that's kind of a core principle here in a humid climate. And Builder says to me, you know, I really, I like what you're saying, but my HVAC installer just doesn't know how to install that VRF equipment. And he says we don't need the DHU. And I feel like, oh, we were just had a good connection. And I want to say to him, well, why don't, there's lots of HVAC installers and there's many of them that know how to install VRF and many of them that know how to install DHU. Um, why don't you just switch? Um, but underlying that, like, what, what is it I should think? What is it I should think or say to help him, that builder change his attitude, which changes his behavior, which changes the industry? Um, Great question. And um, I actually think your answer was really smart because that is a really good answer because that answer is social norming, which is that there are all these other people that are already successfully engaging in this behavior so that mm -hmm. you can look around you. If all these other people can do it, you can do it too. And that's yeah, a highly yeah, yeah. special response. A thing that, um, you know, I, I think... And by the way, just real quick, that's why passive house conferences are so amazing because you're you were looking at these case studies and people are doing it. doing it. One thing that I'd love for people to take away from this conversation is this idea or this reality that information does not in of itself drive a behavior. Mm. So I was having a conversation. So I'm not rational? <laughs> well, yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, we are not, we are not cost benefit analysis machines. <laughs> I'm not. I was speaking to a person the other day who um, was telling me about a conversation they had um, with a with a contractor who said buildings buildings need to breathe. Well, we've all heard this, <laughs> right? We've all heard this. We oh, this person boy. this person is uh, is an archetype in the passive house building community. The person that says buildings need to breathe. So um, the person I was speaking to told me how they answered that, how they answered that statement. And they explained to them why buildings didn't need to breathe. And they gave what, in my mind, was a very precise, succinct, and brilliant answer. However, um, as good as that answer was, it doesn't acknowledge the fact that information isn't what is going to drive that other person's view because it, it neglects to look at what the normative influence on their beliefs are. It neglects to look at their own perceptions about their own control, um, their own abilities to engage in a different kind of behavior and other um, factors that will determine whether or not they think that the benefits outweigh the disadvantages of that behavior. Mm, so in, unless wow. you break it down into all those variables and really look at what's fueling a particular behavior in detail, uh, mm -hmm. you can't really expect to change that behavior. Wow. That, so I guess you could say, if someone said that to me now, after listening to you, I will think to myself, well, good. We have a point of connection here because this person is at least talking past the realm of aesthetics and talking about function. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're talking, they're talking um, about it. And, and the, the, to, to me, the place to go is when a person says something like that. Buildings need is, to breathe. Uh -huh. Is to say, um, you know, is to do like a little investigation. Um, if the person's volunteering that belief, um, why, do you, why do you think uh, this? Uh -huh. and you don't necessarily even need to refute it, but to just collect a little more information so that, you know, in the future we're yeah. better able to, to address that. Um, yeah, because then the next level down would be, oh, the belief is the buildings need to breathe so that they stay dry, so the building materials dry out or something. And then you could say, oh, okay, so it's about drying. It's not really about breathing. And, you know, <laughs> and that's a common enough persona um, that oh, yeah. I would even say that it warrants looking at through the behavioral models to really design a response that we can systematically apply. Um, because mm -hmm. it is a barrier that occurs very frequently. And it probably right. it occurs, you know, it probably occurs in building code meetings. It probably occurs in when, yeah, when home buyers true. are doing their, um, their building applications and their, um, their local governments. 
probably occurs, you know, when a home buyer has a conversation with an architect and they go home and they end up talking to a friend who's a contractor. And then the, in, you know, in one sentence, that friend undoes everything that the architect just told the person. So, yeah, you said we're not cost benefit, benefit machines. And that got me thinking, well, what are we? And I realized, well, what we are at a sort of what you could call a fundamental level is we're mammals. And one of the key, key characteristics of being a mammal is that we emote. And if, if you say to someone says to you, you know, son, a building's got to breathe. Well, what they're really saying is, um, I've been building for a long time and, you know, maybe I'm a third generation builder and I know how homes go together. And when homes go together that way, they breathe and they have a lot of air leakage. So therefore it must be good because if it's not good, holy moly, I'm going to have to, um, accept a large amount of regret (laughs) or a large amount of emotional distress for the fact that my family for three generations has been building in a way that isn't skillful, right? Or something, you know, I think it's a hard place to go. You just put it beautifully. Um, it's, it's acknowledging that the difficulties of that person has to go through to, um, change their views. And it's yeah. by acknowledging that and by examining that, that we're in a better position to address those things, because really it's addressing, um, that type of thing that will help us overcome the barriers to adoption. Wow. This is, this has been so great. Um, we don't have to end it right away, James, but we do need to bring this uh, podcast in for a gradual landing. Are there any sort of takeaways you want to start to, uh, expand on? Absolutely. The experiences of architects and builders, um, are, you know, what, what they experience when they're sitting down with a prospect or when they're talking to a developer, um, those problems, when you, when you take a a look from a sort of a 20,000 foot elevation, a lot of those problems are both predictable and systematic. So if we look at certain things like, um, like a home buyer underestimating the value of the energy and repair savings, that is a problem that is predictable that we can anticipate Mm -hmm. it. and, And it is something that happens uh, over the course of thousands and thousands of meetings with prospects every single year. So because it's predictable and systematic, it deserves a, an organized and systematic response rather than having the architect or builder each time having to address it anew. Mm-hmm. So there are lots of problems uh, or lots of barriers and problems um, like that um, in the building industry. And again, this is about a race 40. <laughs> yeah. So, so the question is, so how do we best address what are those barriers and how do we best address them? But if we address them as just acknowledging that, um, you know, if an architect says to, them, says to themselves, I'm having this problem, it's very likely that other passive architects and builders are having that problem too. This, this mm-hmm. has been my experience in talking to um, passive architects and builders. They, they, um, they talk quite a bit about um, a certain finite number of problems that are that are really uh, making their jobs more difficult and and making it actually sort of costly for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you know, if we just think about a systematic approach to certain problems, if you know, if an architect is wasting say maybe a hundred hours a year on a certain problem, and then there are thousands, there are say a thousand passive architects. Well, that's a lot of hours. It's a hundred thousand hours a year for one problem. So why wouldn't we just develop one systematic solution for that problem? It'd be much more efficient. Oh my gosh. That's fantastic. But I agree completely that there's these hemorrhaging of unnecessary hemorrhaging of of time and attention to solve the same problem over and over. Exactly. And there's a, there's a better way of doing it. So for takeaways, uh, I'd say that there's some, a couple of assumptions out there um, that I disagree with. Um, one is that markets are mysterious and can't be influenced. Um, a market, we can make a market. Um, how we actually frame and satisfy a particular need um, is really up to us and our conscious actions. So there are things that we can do now That means we do not need to wait for policy. It's great that people are updating building codes. um, But when we think about certain challenges, when is Alabama going to insist that 
we only build passive. It's going to be a long ways away. So in the meantime, yeah. you know, let's do things that actually develop this market from a demand point of view. How do people actually pick these houses of their own volition without being pushed there via policy? Yeah. Another takeaway um, is that um, I just want to throw out there that lowering the price for a passive house is not going to transform the market. Hmm. Price competition. I agree. Price competition is not going to do it. When you think about, you know, look at an iPhone. Did an iPhone, does an iPhone have sales regularly or does it try to like lower its price in order to win market share? It doesn't do that. Right. What it does is it wins market share by, by having um, differentiators that people value and by being an order of magnitude better than alternative products. Now people are trying to catch up to them or maybe have already caught up to them. But at the beginning, they were something that was significantly different and people valued those differences. So it's about focusing on, wow. focusing on the difference, not on focusing on the price. Focus on the difference. That's huge. I mean, because Passive House is absolutely the, the iPhone you know, in its class or the Tesla of, of homes. It's, it's well thought out. It's climate zone appropriate. You know, it's investing in the passive enclosure. And we see a, yeah, it's interesting. We see a lot of examples mm-hmm. like that. We see a lot of, um, we've seen market transformation before. And there are procedures that companies have gone through to transform the market. You know, there, there is, of course, good luck and bad luck, but there are a number of things that these successful startups and companies have done to transform markets. And if they hadn't done them, I don't think they would have succeeded. Another thing that I'd like people to take away is that this sentiment that, you know, sometimes stated and sometimes unconscious, that this business just works a certain way and there's nothing that we can do about it. When in fact, um, there are, um, you know, a business or a company is just a machine and that machine can be designed in any number of ways um, and I think should be constantly subject to questions and revisions and that there is no one way of running a business. So it may be comfortable to, to think about things a certain way. But, you know, challenging certain assumptions can often lead you to, to a lot of opportunity. So when I look at um, other market transformations, one example I really like is Uber. You know, I don't have any particular affection for Uber, but there is a, there is a thing that they did which I think um, illustrates what is kind of a law of gravity um, in business. Um, and what Uber did is they didn't buy cars. They didn't hire drivers. The cars existed. They didn't actually get more cars to purchase. The cars existed. So here was an existing asset. And what they did is they they created a technology overlay which changed the utilization of those existing assets. Awesome. So just by virtue of that technology overlay and changing the value, that value was then recognized. Changing utilization changed the value. So, you know, what a race 40 is doing is something very similar. What a race 40 is trying to do is something very similar, which is, um, you know, a race 40 isn't here to um, get conventional architects to become passive architects. Um, and it's not going to create more architects or builders. What a race 40 wants to do is create um, certain pieces missing in the market that causes. Um, home buyers, developers, and others to have a higher utilization of the services of passive architects and builders, to actually to recognize the value of those services, and, and that will basically increase their usage rate. Sorry, that was, that let, is let me so say that again because awesome. that was a little circular what I just said. Um, so a race 40 is Race 40 is going to build the pieces that are missing in the market that cause home buyers and developers to utilize the services of passive architects and builders. The value assigned to those services should reflect the outcome that those services deliver. Beautiful. That is actually, it's very similar to this, um, in, this underlying and implicit distinction we've been making all along between a passive building or a high performance building as a functional asset and then a home in general as an aesthetic asset or a visual spatial asset. Um, the Uber is saying 
look, you know, there's a, a lot of people that really, they don't need to have the um, emotional benefit of an ownership of a car, like it's an art piece or something. They really are just interested in it, or there, there are a lot of people that are significantly interested in just transportation. I need to get from here to there. I, I like I like yeah. that framing of it because you know when I apply it to the to the building industry, the getting from A to B is getting to um, I have good lung health because I've been breathing good air for the last thirty years. Um, I have savings in my bank account because I wasn't paying for uh, oil bills. Um, I've been sleeping better and maybe did better at school or maybe did better at my job because I'm not getting woken up by my neighbor that decides to mow the lawn at six in the morning or by slamming car doors out on the streets. So those outcomes have value attached to them. And when we, when we actually sort of price the value um, or we, when we connect the value of those outcomes to those choices, we end up making smarter decisions. I was reading an article about Richard Thaler the other day. Um, he's uh-huh. you know, he just won the Nobel Prize in behavioral economics. So right. uh, the article said that his work alone, which is designing nudges, um, or it's part of his work, which, which is designing nudges to get people to save more retirement, just the nudges he's designed have been responsible for increased retirement savings of $29 billion. Oh my gosh. Kaboom. I heard that. That was on Freakonomics Radio. I heard that one too. That's, we should link to that in our show. So notes. very okay. simple and small nudges can actually have really profound effects. Beautiful, man. I think that's a, uh, a good place to stop. James, I'm afraid we are going to have to wrap it up here. Um, it's been a real honor and a treat bringing you in and, and, for you listeners, I just want to remind you that this is, in fact, the Building Science Podcast. It's not gone into the um, Building Psychology Podcast, but that as problem solvers, there are many dimensions to this problem of how do we deliver better buildings to ourselves, to society generally, and this is absolutely one of them. I very much want to remind everyone listening, please go to Erase40.org and support this uh, effort that James has underway. It's absolutely foundational to what we're all doing. Uh, anyone listening here is implicitly part of the group of society that wants to see better buildings. So James, any final Yeah, thought? so I mean, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for you know giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, and then just as a last note, um, one thing that has struck me in talking to passive building architects and builders and others is that this is a group of people with a tremendous amount of convictions. Uh, and they've, mm-hmm. they've, what they've accomplished so far is really staggering. Um, they've yeah. overcome really a million technical challenges to produce a, th- a building that is um, really amazing. And this to me just shows how capable uh, this group of people um, really is. And so in my mind, you know, the hard part is really over. So some of the things, the barriers that I'm describing are well within the abilities of, of this community, um, which is one of the reasons why I think it's um, why I think it's worth them looking at because because really I think that this is a group of people that can that can overcome this this group of challenges. Thank you guys for listening and and thank you so much, James Gapner. It was a real honor and a treat to talk with you. And I suspect we'll be doing it again. Thanks again. 